Your Excellencies, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I think we're ready to begin our session. So to all of you distinguished guests, to all our esteemed panelists, delegates, and to all members of the public, the media and civil society, let me warmly welcome you to this high-level discussion titled WTO Reforms, Strengthening the Multilateral System. My name is Lerat Mbele, and it's a great pleasure to be here once again at the public forum. Now, it's needless for me to say that the world around us is changing. And it's a change precipitated by the advent of new technologies. Big tech and data-driven solutions are starting to define how we transact, how we pay for things, and how we engage as citizens across the world. In many cases, it is seamless, it is borderless, it is easy. But it also depends on connectivity. And we know that for a large percentage of the world population, in fact, even more than half, that is a major challenge, connectivity. COVID-19 has also created a complexity that we all understand. It's led to an unprecedented health crisis, but it's also led to supply chain disruptions across the world. The good thing and the positive thing around COVID-19 is it's really given impetus to all of us thinking about how to engage in a more creative way, virtually, very much as we're doing right now with some of our colleagues speaking to us virtually and many of you watching virtually. That helps to amplify this idea of change and being ready for change. And so in today's discussion, as we talk about WTO reforms, we're going to locate them in the reality in which the world finds itself today, looking at the opportunities presented by digitalization, the complexities created by the health crisis, but also the very important social issues that have emerged around us, how to integrate more, how to do business better, and how to be more efficient. That is the nub of the conversation we're having here today. And with those words, let me welcome you warmly. Let me also introduce to you our esteemed panel and just tell you a little bit about each one of them. We have John Denton, who's the Secretary General of the International Chamber of Commerce. He joins us here today. Thank you very much for your time. And as the head of one of the world's largest business organizations, he's going to paint a picture for us about the landscape that is increasingly characterized by these changes I've mentioned in technology, new methods of production, um, labor and employment patterns and migration, and also the very real demographic shifts that we are seeing in many countries of the global south. And so he lends a perspective for business to add their voice to this conversation. So thank you very much, John Denton. We're also uh, joined here by Carlos Maria Carrera, who's the executive director of the South Center. And we know that uh, prior to the pandemic, some developing countries and least developed countries were starting to reap the rewards of a multilateral trading system. Um, it's been a patchy um, program or, or results across the developing world, but nonetheless, many countries of the South have started to feel the impact of change. And as head of the South Center, an organization that defends the interests of developing and least developed countries, we're going to get a perspective from the Global South to see what is working within the multilateral trading uh, system and what could be done better for the benefit of these emerging markets. Joining us virtually from uh, Korea is His Excellency Yeo Han Koo, who's the Minister for Trade and Industry and Energy. We know that Korea is one of the world's greatest success stories when we're looking at trade-led development. Um, the World Economic Forum has also ranked uh, Korea as a country that has been leading in the area of innovation and it's ranked in the top five. And so we're going to be listening to um, some insights as to how Korea has done really well and perhaps for insights that many countries of the developing world can emulate by way of integrating more into the global system. 
We also have His Excellency Ni Adebayo, who is the Minister of Trade, uh, of Industry, Trade and Investment in the Federal Republic of Nigeria. This is Africa's largest economy by size, largest population, and also the leading producer and exporter of oil. And even though Nigeria started to uh, diversify its economy, um, there are so many aspects and complexities of that economy that exemplify um, the circumstances you find in many regional economies of sub-Saharan Africa. But also, just by way of the changes we're seeing in Africa, it accounts for 17% of the global population, um, but only 3% of global trade. And so it's important to hear from the continent's leading economy how best to integrate Africa as well. We are hoping to hear from the uh, UK Minister or Secretary of State for International Trade, the Right Honourable Anne-Marie Trevelyan, um, but we are having a few connectivity problems. As soon as those are overcome, we'll also be welcoming warmly the Right Honourable Anne-Marie Trevelyan. With that, I'd like to say a very, a very warm welcome to our panellists. Let me also just speak to our audience that's connecting uh, virtually. In terms of how you use the platform, we do encourage you to post your questions so that I can pose them on your behalf. Um, what you do is you go to the conference uh, platform, the public forum conference platform. You will use the Q&A functionality. You will post your question. Some of these questions will be moderated just so that they can get to us quickly on stage. And then I'm going to pose them on your behalf and hopefully we can get through as many of those questions coming through from the public. But we'd also like to encourage you to use social media. Use your Twitter accounts, your Facebook, your LinkedIn accounts to participate in this conversation, to share your views, to comment. And you can do so using the hashtag AskPF21. And then for those of you in the room, when it is time to ask questions, may we ask you to indicate your name, where you're from, and the organization. And for everyone, speakers and those raising questions, please can you be as sharp and succinct as possible. Short, sharp questions mean we can get through the hour uh, quickly enough. So without further ado, on my part, let's get this conversation going. Minister from the UK, nice to see you. I'm glad you finally were able to connect. There she is, the Right Honourable Anne-Marie Trevelyan. We have a full panel now. John Denton, let's start with you. Business often looks at fora like this, looks at an organization like the WTO and says, I don't know how whatever decisions are being made there impact my life. I feel it on the back end if I'm paying tariffs or not paying tariffs, but I don't really know who's speaking for me. How can we create um, an environment in which business is constantly seen, heard, and their needs are considered? <laughs> I'm so happy to hear that um, you're thinking about business. One of the most amazing things about multinational organizations is how generally it's seen as uh, an add-on or a sideshow uh, to the to business uh, to to the to the functioning. In fact, I just. Uh, uh, spent a bit of time looking at the uh, white paper developed by uh, Secretary General Guterres on the weekend about a new form of multilateralism, and I was struck by how uh, the Secretary General was able to describe the problem, but the solutions he provided were so stuck in a paradigm of the United Nations of uh, 2000 that he fails to realise that to resolve the problems of the world, you need to actually engage effectively with the private sector. In fact, it's almost mind-boggling that that whole paper makes passing reference only to the role of the only functioning kind of global entity, which is actually the private sector. So I think it's really refreshing, by the way, that uh, under uh, Dr. Ngozi, that the business community and uh, its thoughts and its recommendations are actually brought into the discussion of the WTO. You ask a very good question. How do we feel relevant? Well, the fact of the matter is we are end users of the WTO. Uh, and when we think about the WTO, for it to be useful for us, it has to function, it has to be fit for purpose for the 21st century. The issues it deals with have to deal with issues to do with the 21st century and it needs to get its operating model uh, into some order. I mean, it's kind of crazy when you look at the way this show operates that it, uh, you can have ministers and prime ministers and leaders at the G20, G7 level instruct the negotiators in uh, Geneva to get on and get things done and then they studiously ignore them 
and you see that with the fisheries agreement, fisheries subsidies agreement, where how many times in 21 years, and I'm relatively new to this game, so I'm looking at the history books here, have they been instructed to finish this deal? And they haven't. What kind of credibility does this organisation have going towards the end of this year? So it needs to actually grapple with issues of, that it's been told to grapple with because they're relevant issues. It needs to have credibility. It needs to be dealing with issues to do with the pandemic. I mean, the WTO took itself out of the game in the pandemic. Thank God Dr. Vigozzi is here because she's actually resurrected and engaged on that issue. Uh, I've taken a proposal this morning. We've launched a very important, I think, uh, set of recommendations around five themes really building on the need for relevance of the, uh, of the WTO. One area is that we need to learn from what's just happened and prepare the organisation to grapple with health crises in the future. And it's not because we see the WTO as the WHO, but if you want to increase access to vaccines, you have to be able to increase production and you actually have to be able to distribute it. So we've come up with a proposal to do that. So it's got to deal with those sorts of issues and the WTO needs to recognise that and it's got to deal with the digital agenda. Thank God you're able to be connected, Minister, because we were worried <laughs> that the digital agenda may not have actually got, all, got the UK in, but uh, welcome uh, and congratulations on your appointment. All new, all new agendas will have slight teething problems. What I'd like you to do for me, uh, John Denton, is very briefly, give us a sense of what are the priorities that international business would like attended to? Because we're in a digital world, because we're dealing with COVID-19, some of the issues you've painted up, but what should be foremost of mind for considerations at the WTO? Well, there's, as I said, the first thing is getting the operating model working again, because you're not going to fix issues like the appellate process unless you get a system that's working. The fact that the system doesn't work means that a lot of issues are not dealt with by uh, in the appropriate jurisdiction, appropriate uh, modality of WTO, they're kicked upstairs to the appellate process and the appellate process that has been wandering outside of its jurisdiction. It needs to be able to function effectively built on the way in which the organisation was built. And that's not happening at the moment. There are too many things that haven't actually been thought about. The fact that the notification system is actually now not operating, it means that things like supply chain notifications during the, 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 the crisis were not actually done. So we need to update that. So really getting that operating model uh, working properly is really important. I think it needs to be front and centre of the fight against the pandemic. Because this pandemic is not over, but the lessons learned from, as I said before, will be relevant. It needs to have a function that enables it to monitor the market information systems that, that actually surround the supply chains to enable us to increase production, etc. The next issue, it needs to join up climate and trade. This kind of craziness that the, the guys and girls in uh, Geneva think that they're operating in a vacuum from the, from the work that's going on in trying to ensure that we reach Paris is just lunacy. It needs to be joined up. We can't have functioning businesses in a planet that is actually not functioning. We need to work on that, and this group needs to understand it's important. That's the fisheries subsidies, the only live environmental negotiation on foot. But it needs to work on environmental goods and services. But it's also got to look at this issue of how carbon's handled. It's got to actually ensure that we have a functioning digital platform. So we need to ensure, first of all, that the moratorium continues against uh, uh, duties and taxes on uh, digital downloads, digital transfers, but it needs to get with the 21st century and have legally enforced digital documentation. I see the UK Secretary here, and I shout out to the UK leadership of the G7, because we propose to the G7 and the ICC that you actually do get to a point where you have legal recognition, because without that, you can't have the functionality required by SMEs to trade and you need to therefore have face-to-face -face or wet signatures, you've got to have access to digital signatures. And then you need to be inclusive. You need to ensure that we bring 50% of the global population into the trading world, which is women. Right. And you need to work on that as well. Okay, so in a nutshell, what I'm hearing from you is we can't speak from ivory towers. You have to understand what business is facing at the coal face and then create alignment of policies and protocols. I'd like you to bring in, you into the conversation now, um, uh, Carlos. Integration is a word that's been used here of a significant proportion of the global population that's not here, women, but also some would say the developing world, the emerging markets, that the architecture of the WTO as we understand it, the architecture of global trade and finance really was designed to serve the G20. Everybody else doesn't really have a place. How do we change that? Bien, gracias por esta pregunta. 
Efectivamente, el sistema internacional ha sido construido en gran medida en beneficio de los países con más recursos y es indispensable que la reforma del sistema, la reforma de la arquitectura del sistema financiero internacional, la reforma que se propone en la Organización Mundial de Comercio responda a los intereses de los países que hoy están excluidos, como es el caso, por ejemplo, de los países menos adelantados. Entonces, cuando hablamos de una reforma de la Organización Mundial de Comercio en particular, no solamente debe asegurar que el carácter multilateral de la organización es preservado enteramente, sino que debe superarse la fragmentación que existe hoy en el sistema internacional de reglas. El sistema de comercio no puede operar separadamente del sistema de derechos humanos, en particular del derecho al desarrollo debe integrarse a los objetivos que la comunidad internacional ha adoptado en la Agenda 2030. Es decir, el sistema comercial de comercio debe ser parte de un mecanismo que promueva el bienestar global, el bienestar de todos los países. Y en este sentido, cuando hablamos de integración de los países en desarrollo en el sistema multilateral de comercio, es, naturalmente es importante preguntarse no solamente si esa integración debe tener lugar, sino cómo debe tener lugar. Un gran número de países en desarrollo hoy siguen siendo dependientes de materias primas. La integración de esos países en un sistema de comercio simplemente como proveedores de materias primas de poco valor agregado no creará el empleo, no generará las condiciones de desarrollo que son necesarias. De manera tal que es, que es indispensable que haya un enfoque más global que permita a esos países diversificar sus economías, generar valor agregado, no ser partícipes, por ejemplo, en las cadenas de valor global, solamente en las partes más bajas de esas cadenas, donde el valor agregado es mínimo. Este es, este es un desarrollo integral, es una visión integral en la cual el sistema de comercio internacional debe ser parte y no, no pensar simplemente que integrándose las reglas actuales esto va a suceder, es necesaria una acción más decidida. Para dar solamente un, un ejemplo adicional, el tema de los países menos adelantados, en el programa de acción de Istanbul se postulaba que para el año 2020 al menos el 50% de los países menos adelantados podrían alcanzar el nivel de graduación. Esto no ha sucedido. Y es indispensable que se considere esta situación en particular, así como la situación de los países que llegan a estado de graduación, pero deben seguir disfrutando de ciertas ventajas de los países menos adelantados. A very comprehensive response, lodged in a lot of policy and theory. I think what the WTO would want to know is what are the concrete steps that can be taken here, right now. 2021-2022, that can start to advance opportunities for integration for countries in the developing world and those least developing countries that you're talking about. Just kind of key interventions that could be made and then it's up to the policymakers and the regulators in those home countries to implement them or not, but what could really help? Una, una intervención crítica eh, en relación con los países menos adelantados es para los países miembros de la Nacional de Comercio de apoyar la propuesta que han hecho los países menos adelantados a través de la misión de Chad en noviembre del año pasado, para que haya un periodo de 12 años posterior a la graduación de esos países, para que se le apliquen las disciplinas que son las que rigen en general a los países miembros de la OMS. Es decir, deben tener un tiempo adicional para poder mantener ventajas, por ejemplo, ventajas arancelarias, de manera que esos países puedan proseguir en el camino de desarrollo. Una segunda intervención importante tiene que ver con el diseño de la llamada reforma del sistema OMC, en un sentido que no limite la capacidad de acción de los países en cuestiones críticas, como por ejemplo la política industrial. Los países en desarrollo necesitan de un espacio de políticas para generar las condiciones que les permitan integrarse de una manera positiva y con generación de bienestar 
al sistema internacional. Si se integran en su situación actual, como mencionaba antes, esto no se va a lograr. Let me bring into the conversation um, the Honourable Minister for Trade and Industry and Energy in Korea. Honourable Minister, we know that Korea is one of the success stories, as I said earlier on, of what trade-led development looks like. May I ask you just to share with us some of the internal reforms that were undertaken in Korea? to help the country integrate more in global value chains and in, within the trading system? And then secondly, the reforms that you think the WTO can put in place to create an enabling environment for other countries um, to do the same. Um, thank you very much. Can you hear me well? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation and uh, also for this opportunity to uh, contribute, especially on the topic, you know, near and dear to my heart. As you mentioned, uh, Korea is considered one of the successful uh, stories of how a country uh, can grow from one of the poorest country in the world into, you know, one of the advanced countries in, in the world in, I think, uh, in, you know, 60 years or so. Uh, you may be familiar with, you know, all these high-tech uh, Korean products uh, you see every day in your home or in your office and in between, but it was not the case about 60 years ago. Uh, do you know what was the number one export product from Korea in 1960s or 70s? Around that time, uh, our number one product, export product was a wheat. wheat. At that time, you know, Korean mothers and sisters, uh, they had to cut their long, beautiful hair off uh, to, you know, put food on the table for their family. And then the Korean wig was very popular around the world because it was made of human hair, not plastic. But, you know, Korea um, sort of, uh, you know, move up the, the value chain, global value chain. We started from this wig but then we move on to textile and then light electronics, steel, and then automobiles, and then you know, semiconductors, uh, et cetera. So I think uh, one of the success uh, you know, recipes for, for that uh, the achievement was I think that a proactive role by the government. Uh, the Korean government uh, played a very uh, proactive role in promoting this export. Uh, we help you know, small and medium enterprises or many other uh, industrial sector uh, to you know, find new market uh, in you know, unknown, uh, you know, this unknown um, um, areas. And also uh, this private and you know, public partnership uh, which made uh, all this happen. So, I would say those elements are one of the uh, successful factors. And, um, you know, on your second uh, element of your question, which is what would be the enabling environment for other countries to follow the footsteps of Korea's successful model. I think, uh, as uh, other panelists mentioned, um, the world is changing, rapidly digitalizing. And I think that this the digital trade rule, uh, that could really pave uh, you know, the path uh, to uh, bring many other uh, developing uh, countries into uh, this you know, fast track of development. Right. Let me also take another example. Uh, do you remember um, this uh, Gangnam Style? <laughs> yes. um, this you know, completely unknown song from unknown uh, Korean singer uh, with you know, the weird act. But once that, uh, you know, the, the song was uploaded on YouTube, that became an instant hit around the world. <laughs> and that, I think this case really shows that uh, if you have, you know, good and creative idea, and uh, if you bring some entrepreneur, entrepreneurial uh, spirit and skill, then I think, you know, right. you can make things happen uh, in this the digitalized world. Right. And then, you know, you can... Uh, you can trade with the world. So I think it really shows that uh, the power of digital 
trade and how all these small and medium enterprises and uh, mom and pop mm -hmm. businesses around the world and in developing country, how they can make full use of this digital platform, you know, to really build their business and then trade with the world. So in that sense, I think that uh, joint statement, um, you know, initiative on e-commerce, that could be a very right. signif significant step forward to really facilitate uh, this process. So I think what we can do is to really uh, kind of uh, um, you know, accelerate our negotiation on this e-commerce. Uh, and then I think that could be a starting mm. point. I'll stop here and come back later. Thank you. You've given us such a, a, a broad picture of how it's been achieved for uh, Korea over the 60 years. It's the aesthetic, the wigs. I, I'm going to appreciate that personally. <laughs> it's Gangnam style, it's creativity, it's music, but it's innovation as well. Mm -hmm. Seeing that Asia as a region has started to account for a significant proportion of global growth, economic activity and manufacturing, on this question of access, on this question of integration, could you also just give us an understanding of how regional economies have come together? I know that the most recent and prominent um, element is the uh, Asia-Pacific Pact of 2020, of 2020 that was signed, but how do you start to integrate yourselves more into global value chains that is very constructive and transformative as well? Could you just briefly tell us about that? Yes, um, thank you for the question. Um, I think, you know, if you look at this Asia Pacific region, um, there has been sort of systematic uh, division of role, uh, you know, uh, across the value chain. So, for example, um, you know, in 1980s and, you know, 90s, uh, Japan played a more higher tech, uh, whereas China was, you know, you know more lower tech and then sort of, you know, Korea is in the middle. And then there has been a lot of a movement of this capital, you know, people and businesses across the border. Um, and I think that really happened in the private sector uh, by this commercial uh, interest. But I think uh, what we saw last year uh, was that the conclusion of RCEP, we call it RCEP, uh, where, you know, 15, uh, countries in the region came together to conclude, uh, you know, one of the, you know, largest uh, free trade agreement uh, in the region. And I was a chief negotiator uh, on the Korean side. And I think uh, uh, that's sort of, uh, I mean, the, the most, the, the best case scenario is that, you know, WTO uh, could be really functioning well. And then uh, with this, all this multilateral uh, negotiation, but, um, you know, as a sort of a second best choice in this regional format, uh, with this kind of regional integration, I think uh, we could, you know, facilitate uh, this integration of this regional market uh, with this plurilateral uh, trade deal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me bring in the Honorable Minister of Industry, Trade and Investment from Nigeria, Minister Adebayo. Thank you very much for your time. So much is happening on the African continent, collaboration um, and the coming into commission of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, literally starting on the 1st of January 2021. Tell us a little bit about the momentum that exists to integrate markets on the African continent and perhaps how this could help to then integrate the African continent into world markets. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's yeah, very uh, good to be with you this afternoon. I'm happy to be with you. Uh, I do, like you rightly mentioned, uh, the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement uh, came into effect on the 1st of uh, January this year. However, uh, there are specific challenges that we are still facing for it to be fully functional. Uh, the uh, African Continental Free uh, Market is the market of about 1.3 billion uh, people. Uh, uh, the population of the market 1.3 billion. And um, we believe that uh, it gives Africa the opportunity to trade uh, amongst it for inter-Africa trade. Uh, it is one of the biggest uh, markets in the world. And uh, we believe that um, 
by trading amongst ourselves, we will be able to uh, get better advantages that we currently have because of the challenges that face us uh, integrating into the multilateral trading system. Uh, as you are well aware, Africa is uh, endowed with enormous resources uh, and it provides us with the opportunity of being a major player in the global economy, and, uh, and especially in the uh, multilateral trading system. However, in spite of uh, Africa's potentials, uh, it continues to face both internal and external challenges, which impedes its integration into the global economy. Uh, let me start by uh, uh, listing some of the external challenges which uh, we face. Uh, lack of market access uh, in sectors of export interest, and unfair trade rules and practices that lead to low levels of export. Uh, in particular, tariff peaks and tariff escalation have restricted African exports to primary commodities, which are subject to cyclical price fluctuations that undermine the continent's development potential. Um, there are trade distorting domestic support in agriculture, and uh, uh, the unwillingness of WTO membership to strengthen special and differential treatment provisions in respective WTO agreements in line with the Doha mandate continue to undermine the effective uh, participation of Africa in the multilateral trading system, given the continent's capacity constraints. Uh, some of the internal challenges which we face, uh, which we recognize, are the fact that we have a low level of industrialization and economic diversification, uh, we have poor regulatory framework, uh, low institutional capacity, and low, a weak productive capacity. And we are hopeful that uh, uh, our, 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 uh, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement will give us an opportunity to improve on uh, the capacity, uh, the lack of capacity that I've just mentioned. Uh, we have huge supply side constraints, uh, such as poor access to credit and uh, poor technical capacity both in knowledge and skills, uh, the low levels of research and innovation, and poor infrastructure, mm -hmm. particularly energy, which is a major, major constraint. Uh, our connectivity also is a major problem, and it has a negative effect on our competitiveness. Yeah. So these are some of the major constraints that we have, uh, but we believe that uh, with the coming into effect of this agreement that we have signed uh, among the African countries, right. we will be able to work on all these problems with a view to making us more competitive right. and uh, making us, uh, to put us in a position to, uh, to compete on a global scale. Absol Thank you. Absolutely. And at, at, at the very least, there's a blueprint for what change ought to look like internally in Africa. I'm going to take this opportunity, um, Your Excellency Adebayo, to pose to you a question that's coming through online. It is from uh, Dele Sanya Julianson who says, what role is your government in Nigeria playing to advocate responsible commercial diplomacy as the mainstream of foreign policy and effective tool for the strengthening of the multilateral system? So I guess it's kind of using your voice and your political capital to advocate for new forms of commercial activity, investment activity, look seeking out opportunities and integrating it into all other fora in which you engage with the world yes uh, basically we uh, the government has uh, embarked on major diplomacy uh, programs we are engaging uh, of the world with regards to uh, trade we have come up with new uh, investment uh, proposed uh, programs and uh, a, lot, a lot of work is being done in that, in that area. Uh, we, have, uh, we have engaged, uh, like I said, diplomatically with uh, many uh, countries of the world. We attend uh, various uh, investment programs uh, all over the world. We, uh, we are involved in uh, uh, seeing to it that uh, various chambers of commerce uh, are um, are set up in the country with, uh, and we are in, involved in very many bilateral talks with uh, various countries of the world. Thank you for that. There is a question that's come through from Alexia Nefeli Duma to you, Carlos. And um, the question is how do you envisage the interplay between trade 
and human rights law in a reformed WTO system? Bueno, gracias por la pregunta. Eh, esto es algo que debe ser explorado. Sería importante que en el ámbito de la Nación Mundial de Comercio este tema sea considerado. Eh, naturalmente, eh, los, los paneles y el órgano de apelación de la Nación Mundial de Comercio, cuando se ha restablecido y debe ser restablecido, también debería considerar en eh, sus decisiones el marco más general que brinda el derecho, um, el, el derecho humano. De manera que este, que este es un tema que sería importante introducir de manera sistémica en la organización. Eh, como señalaba antes, eh, no podemos seguir considerando el sistema de comercio como un sistema aislado, que no tiene que ver con los objetivos globales de la comunidad internacional, los objetivos de desarrollo. Y naturalmente, derechos humanos es una parte importante eh, en ese esquema. Hasta ahora, generalmente, los, los paneles que toman decisiones en las disputas en la Nación Mundial de Comercio eh, se centran en los temas comerciales. Debe haber una visión distinta, debe reconocerse, tener deferencia respecto a los objetivos de política de los países, eh, teniendo en cuenta en particular sus eh, esfuerzos eh, para realizar los derechos humanos. Let's raise a question here from um, Avishka Jayawera. I'm going to pose it to you, John, which says, is there a risk that the core values of the WTO, such as non-discrimination, market access and free trade, might be compromised in the reform process? You spoke about the need to really think, rethink and reimagine the WTO operationally, but are there potential blind spots, setbacks? No, in, in, in fact, if you go, you go back and look at the six guiding mm -hmm. principles uh, which, uh, which uh, enable the establishment of the WTO, it also reflects partly what's been asked in the question. When we talk about ensuring that WTO is fit and proper and fit for purpose in the 21st century, those principles should guide us. They should continue to guide us. What's actually happened is we've lost our way. Where's the transparency which is actually expected? with the failure of the notification process? Where is the accountability with the failure of the appellate process? All these elements are relevant. But also, the, uh, one of the key principles of the establishment of the WTO was the obligation to work effectively with other parts of the global multilateral world in order to pursue economic growth. Economic growth in the 21st century will only happen when it's joined up with action on climate, action on SDGs. These are all requirements. And when we call, for example, for the, uh, the creation of this mechanism to help, help in terms of future health mechanisms, we're talking about working with the World Customs Organization, with the OECD, with the WHO. These are all critical elements. So no, in fact, I, I, I genuinely think uh, we're kind of reinventing a heritage brand here based on very clear principles. And those principles were sound 25 years ago and they're sound now, just that the world has changed. We now operate in a world that didn't exist before, which is actually a digitally enabled world. And let's not forget that only the internet only went to the public domain some two years after the WTO right. came into existence and the rules weren't set up for it. Uh, just before I pose my next question, I think it's important for me to state that we are really having serious connectivity issues uh, with the UK minister, and that's the only reason that I haven't deferred to her. Um, there are some connectivity issues in the United Kingdom at the moment, and as soon as we can resolve that, we can pose some questions to her. Fit for purpose is a term you've used, and I think when we talk now in a contemporary setting about fit for purpose, it's really preparing any organization for this brave new digitalized world that we've been talking about. The AI technologies, they're here, data is here. How do we really make the WTO future-proof, if that's a term, or forward-thinking to start not just operationally integrating a lot of these new tech ideas and functionalities, but to put things like e-commerce front and center, to really think about what the world is going to become and to make sure that they're ready for what the world is going to become. Well, well the first thing is don't operate in the isolated bubble of Geneva. Welcome in, as you are today, under the leadership of Dr. Ngozi, the business community and civil society uh, and, frankly, the union movement. I, actually, what we want is to make trade work for people and planet. That's actually the campaign we run. 
I heard what was said before by Carlos. It's incredibly important that trade is human-centric. It's incredibly important that the digital agenda is human-centric as well. And so we think that's really important. But do not operate in a bubble. Uh, and that's why we're asking about joining up, convergence, these sorts of areas. Let's not forget the International Chamber of Commerce, the world's basically most trusted business organization, but also the largest. About 65% of us are in the developing economy, developing world, uh, least developed, developing, and middle income economies. Uh, and I'm proud of that. Uh, I heard the minister speak from Nigeria. We are opening centers of entrepreneurship in Lagos because we want to help entrepreneurship. We're opening centers of entrepreneurship in Argentina, Carlos, in Buenos Aires, but we're linking that up with regional areas in Buenos Aires. We, are, we put our money where our mouth is. We actually do stuff. Yeah. It's actually about creating the environment where entrepreneurialism right. can actually exist. It's not necessarily about giving people jobs. It's giving them the skills to enable right. them to build functioning uh, opportunities for themselves in an effective market right. economy. We want their support. We want their support. Yeah and understanding because they are the ones who need access to a digital platform. Right. If you really want to be able to operate effectively in the 21st century, it's not a brave new world, right. it is the world. We need to give them digitalized mm. opportunities. That's why we're running a campaign to digitize five million businesses, SMEs in, uh, in Africa. Mm. While we're working with Mwamkili Mene at the African Continental yeah. Free Trade Association to digitize as many as we can, but also to have legally enforceable recognition yeah. of the instruments of trade which will enable them to operate. I mean, right. that's the sort of stuff we right. do. And the WTO must be facilitative of that. In fact, as, you, as you're speaking this way, despite what the Honourable Minister of Nigeria said about connectivity challenges, you know, the largest two-thirds of the um, um, mergers and acquisitions and deal flows in the tech and startup um, sector two-thirds of those in the last year went to Nigeria alone. So there's a lot of enterprising ideas and, and, and innovation that's taking place even in some of these challenged markets. I want to come to you, uh, Honorable Adebayo, and raise another issue of our era, climate change. And we heard earlier on that it's very important to start integrating discussions and protocols for um, the reduction of uh, carbon emissions and green solutions into how we see the international network on trade. Now, I'm posing this question to you because as Africa's largest oil producer, the question is, what are you doing by way of energy transitions and doing it in such a way that it starts to completely transform a Nigeria and how it interacts with the rest of the world in this era? Well, like, like you rightly pointed out, uh, that is a major concern for us as a country because uh, our major uh, export earnings are from uh, fossil fuel oil, uh, principally. Uh, but uh, our, pres our president, President Mohamed Buhari, is very, very concerned about climate change. It's uh, something that's very dear to his heart. So we are looking and trying to find ways of diversifying our economy. We're trying to find ways of... Uh, reducing uh, emission, uh, uh, emissions, uh, carbon emissions. And uh, we, we try to see what we can do to uh, reduce our dependence on, on oil. Uh, a lot is going on in that regard. And uh, a lot of uh, uh, focus uh, and energy is being put towards the use of cleaner fuels. Uh, we are uh, trying to work more uh, with gas than with oil. And uh, we are doing a lot in respect of uh, trying to produce energy by using solar, uh, solar energy as well. So a lot of work is going on in that regard. Thank you so much. And John, I don't know whether you want to add to what's just being said, and it's not now the Nigerian example, it's just generally how to start integrating climate solutions, green solutions, um, transitioning countries into this new agenda. Well, I'm, I'm honoured to, to sit on the African Infrastructure Green Investment Bank, and I can tell you, and that, of course, is supported and funded by a number of the major uh, equity players, but also government players in Africa, front and centre in the thinking around investment and in infrastructure is actually the green implications of that. It's actually happening. And what we, in a funny way, what we actually want is for global fora, global agreements to catch up with where the private sector is. The point I often make is the private sector is way ahead of government in total. 
Uh, and uh, when I look at the challenges, and I really do shout out to, I'm sorry the, the minister from the UK can't speak because uh, you know, the leadership of the UK at G7, the leadership of the UK on COP26, and the fact that they're putting climate change front and centre, the fact that they're actually working hard on the digital agenda. These are, these are elements of leadership that should not be forgotten. But they're doing that in the comfort, I suspect, that the business community is 100% there behind them. In fact, it's a little bit ahead of them. So there's room to catch up and there's room for leadership here. So we are integrating green solutions. And, even, and at the ICC, for example, we come up with practical tools. We actually have got tools available which we provide to SMEs to enable them to measure their GHG footprint, then give them an indication of how they can actually bring right. that down, give them a certification so they can then have access right. to lower cost financing. It's cool, if you ever want to look it up, ICC SME 360X, it's a remarkable innovation about how the business community is leading in action right. on climate. Okay, so um, collaborating much, much more with the private sector and you know, letting them take the lead where they have the competence. I'd like to defer to you, um, Your Excellency EO from um, um, Trade and Industry and Energy in Korea. There is a question here uh, posted by Eugene James, which is the COVID-19 pandemic risks leaving many developing and least developed countries behind. What actions can advanced economies and large trading countries take to prevent the fragmentation of the global economy? So I want us to underscore this term, prevent the fragmentation of the global economy. Could you just give us a sense of how Korea has coped with the COVID pandemic in terms of um, the economy and the labor markets, and perhaps some of the things that can be done to keep a country in the system despite an unprecedented uh, crisis like COVID-19. Yes, um, thank you for the uh, excellent question. I think that's a global challenge that you know every nation is facing these days, and Korea was no exception. Um, I think Korea has gone through uh, this pandemic uh, with our main principle of keeping our economy open throughout this pandemic. So we have never uh, closed down our economy. We never locked down uh, so far. Uh, but I think uh, we, you know, uh, impose very strict uh, social distance, distancing measures and try to balance out between, you know, the, this uh, quarantine and then the safety of people uh, and um, you know, this recovering economy. So I think that's a sort of a, you know, principle that uh, Korea has uh, upheld uh, throughout the pandemic. When, uh, in regarding the vaccine, I completely agree. I mean, President Moon has been a strong advocate of this equal access to vaccine by all people around the world, you know, whether they are from developing country or developed country. I think uh, the practical approach uh, that Korea is taking is that Korea is aiming to uh, position ourselves as a you know, global vaccine production hub so that um, you know, we have this uh, world's second largest uh, biomedicine production capacity, uh, but we don't necessarily have this high tech, you know, this mRNA uh, technology, uh, which is necessary for this, uh, you know, uh, the state of the art uh, vaccine. So if we find ways to combine uh, this competitive advantage that each country has, for example, Korea has a production capacity, uh, other European or American you know, uh, companies have this technology. So if we combine, then, then you know, uh, find ways to really uh, scale up and ramp up this product, production capacity in a you know the speedy manner, I think we could produce you know uh, enough vaccine uh, to provide to our own country, but also to all these developing countries around the world. So I think we really need this international cooperation um, to save our human you know being from from this novel virus. So that. That, I think that is in line with the third way approach that uh, Dr. Ngoji is advocating. Uh, so uh, that's, uh, that's our approach. Thank you.
Yes, and this issue of um, intellectual property and waivers, it was dealt with extensively in yesterday's high-level forum, so I won't belabor that point because we really understand what needs to be done in uh, ensuring that there's vaccine access the world over and using the capacities that exist in uh, other markets to manufacture. There is a question here, um, which I'm going to pose to you, uh, Carlos Correa. It is from Christine Abonge from Cameroon, and she says, what reforms can the WTO put in place for um, an enabling environment where we situate women at the center of these reforms? Reforms shouldn't make women more vulnerable in running their businesses. So this is really about that issue. Is, um, you know, I think people don't really understand the stats when it comes to women, just how much of an economic force they are both as producers and as consumers? Yeah, eh, bien, es una pregunta muy importante que tiene que ver con la orientación general de la reforma. ¿sí? Como mencionaba antes, esta reforma no tiene que ser concentrada simplemente en los objetivos del comercio. El comercio no es un fin en sí mismo. El comercio es un instrumento que debe servir objetivos superiores. Eh, incluyendo eh, el tener en cuenta las, eh, los sectores más vulnerables de la población, la situación de la mujer en muchos países. Se ha hablado recién de la importancia del comercio electrónico, pero debemos recordar también que la agricultura es un tema del siglo XXI. En los trabajos de la Nación Mundial de Comercio es importante que se lleguen a acuerdos que son esenciales, como señalaba el ministro de Nigeria para los países en desarrollo en, en temas agrícolas y en otros temas de la agenda de Doha que no han sido concluidos. Lo que quiero señalar es que no, 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 no debemos perder de vista con las temáticas del siglo XXI que estos temas siguen siendo fundamentales para que el siglo XXI ofrezca oportunidades de desarrollo, de crecimiento, de bienestar in all the countries, including today in the countries most vulnerable. There is a, a, a question I'd like to raise personally, and that just has to do with how we as civil society and the public often see things unfolding at a WTO or multilateral level. And that is what seems to be a preoccupation with a country like China, the second largest economy in the world, and blocks that are then formed to discuss whether China should be defined as a developing nation or not, uh, whether they pursue fair practices, that's become very dominant in terms of conversations around reform. And the question I'd like to ask is, are some of those concerns valid? Are they exaggerated? And in many countries of the South, they think the, the rising of a China is very good for that diversity we've been talking about, for that change in perspective that we've been talking about, because there is a status quo shift that needs to happen in general. Could we address that? Because a lot of the issues around reform of the WTO system have to do with so many things that we're seeing in the East. Perhaps you, John. Yeah, sure. Um, well, maybe the, the better way of looking at it is that uh, what was the, um, the purpose of the WTO and the way in which it was developed, it was actually built around the whole principle of enabling a functioning, global, globally accessible market economy. That's what it was. Um, and when there were new accessions to the WTO, the accessions to the WTO signed on on the basis that uh, over a period of time, their economic systems would be reformed to enable them to function effectively within that setting. That's actually the tension. That's not China related. That's also related to India. That's also related to Brazil. That's also related from time to time to South Africa. There's actually issues to do with the way in which economies operate. And there's a tension with the actual underlying principle and the underlying principled approach about what, uh, what guided the development of the WTO. And so there's a need for those countries to live up to the promises they made on accession, which is to continue to reform. Because what you're seeing without that is the system doesn't quite work, and it rubs up against each other, itself, and that's where you get the friction. The friction can't be dealt with because of the lack of global cooperation, and that's when you get it kicked again upstairs to the appellate process, and so they start dabbling in basically decisions and areas that should have been resolved by the members. 
Uh, that's what I think is really going on here. And the other element was that there was a, and this is particularly for, and I know this from the extent of coverage that the IC has in developing countries, that there was a general expectation that um, opening up uh, trade barriers and participating in the WTO would increase, on aggregate, wealth in the, in the global world. In a way it has, but not in, the, not in the particularities that's needed. There are clearly elements of global society that have been left behind. And on aggregate, there's been improvement on the, the uh, uh, analysis of, uh, of ex ex you know, the number of people in extreme poverty. There's no doubt that's improved over the years. But also, at the same time, there are pockets, but there are also large swathes of communities which actually do not feel that they benefit. So there was two underlying assumptions, both of which were bold. One was that the countries that exceed would actually continue to reform to enable them to effectively cooperate and operate within the WTO system. And the other, which was, that, was that, that everybody would feel the benefits, and they haven't. And so we need to write those uh, elements in terms of make trade work for people and planet. It continued the reform process to ensure that the organisation is functioning. Carlos Correa, I'd like to pose the same question to you, but really rephrase it by saying, if reform entails a change in the status quo as we know it, is that the reason why there have been so many delays? That's certainly the view from many in the Global South, as you know, you've got to just overhaul everything, and those who've benefited are not happy with the idea of, you know, not calling the shots. Ya, yeah. bien, volviendo a la, a la pregunta inicial y a su complemento, eh, efectivamente eh, estos argumentos respecto del papel de China son claramente exagerados y producto de una narrativa que se ha desarrollado sobre todo en los Estados Unidos, que ven a la China como un adversario, no solamente en el plano económico y comercial, sino tecnológico. Como sabemos, China ha hecho progresos enormes, en materia tecnológica, ahora está avanzando la producción de semiconductores, de, de computadoras, ha demostrado que puede producir vacunas rápidamente para el COVID-19, de manera tal que hay una narrativa que se ha desarrollado que se ha también insertado en el marco de la Nación Mundial de Comercio con la idea de que debería haber capacidad en el sistema de reglas comerciales para determinar cuál es la estrategia de desarrollo que los países miembros pueden seguir o no. Esto me parece que es eh, tremendamente criticable y negativo. Los países deben tener la capacidad de elegir sus estrategias de desarrollo, como lo señaló el distinguido Ministro de Comercio de Corea, el desarrollo económico y tecnológico de Corea puede explicarse en gran medida por el rol crucial que tuvo el gobierno en dirigir ese desarrollo y en proveer los recursos para hacerlo. Entonces, es fundamental que en el marco de la Nación Mundial de Comercio se mantenga la libertad para que los países elijan sus estrategias de desarrollo. Y, y debemos superar, eh, yo creo, esta, eh, esta, esta crítica que es injustificada eh, respecto del modo en que un país en particular, exitoso, como ha sido la China, ha llevado a los niveles de eliminación de pobreza y de desarrollo tecnológico que, que ha alcanzado en estos últimos okay, años. I, I don't want to belabor this issue on the status quo. I think we've had a fairly balanced response um, here on stage. I'm going to pose this question to you, um, Honorable Minister Yeo, in um, Korea, which is a question from Jacob Chanda Pillay from Dubai Customs. And the question is, micro and small scale enterprises are on the back foot or they are disadvantaged with it when it comes to the digital revolution. These micro and small scale businesses um, this sector is vital for any resilient economy and without addressing the problems that micro and small scale businesses face, the world cannot be a better place. Um, what initiatives are there for having an inclusive policy model? So just beyond the WTO and what can happen, how can small and medium enterprises be better supported in this digital era to make sure that they can participate meaningfully in global trade, and if that's really an area that's lagging, what are the suggestions that could come to the WTO to help them? Uh, thank you for that uh, excellent question. I think, uh, you know, I absolutely agree with you that, um, you know, this uh, digital trade can really help 
uh, these small and medium enterprises and also mom and pop businesses around the world to uh, really uh, lift themselves up uh, and um, you know have better access to the global market uh, but you know in any country uh, small and medium enterprises uh, they need some capacity building and uh, they need you know uh, skill uh, you know skills training and also they need uh, some you know the systematic uh, help from uh, in terms of their marketing uh, identifying new you know opportunity in new market etc so I think that's the area where really this private and public partnership uh, can play a big role. So um, in case of Korea, uh, I also learned uh, this morning, I, I read an interesting article about Nigeria. It looks like the fintech industry uh, in Nigeria is booming and also uh, unicorn uh, companies are really, you know, uh, popping up in Nigeria. So. I think they're just really encouraging. Um, so in case of Korea as well, uh, we have this uh, very active uh, you know, policy uh, measures uh, throughout the value chain you know, of this, uh, the small and medium enterprises from you know, this R&D or this planning stage to uh, the distribution, distribution channel and then marketing and you know, et cetera, and the extra mile as well. So, uh, I think uh, what WPO can do is to let uh, these member countries to share their best practices on how to support uh, these small and medium enterprises and incorporate them into this global value chain and th this global you know, trading opportunities. Thank you. And then a final question from our uh, delegates and participants is from Mohammed Abu Saleh. And I'm going to pose this one to you, Honorable Minister in Nigeria. If there's any scope within the existing WTO system to reflect on right to trade and development for LDCs, least developed countries, and if the current framework is really helping least developed countries integrate in the system, what's your perspective? Uh, we believe, honestly, there has to be reform. Uh, reform that effectively address the concerns and priorities of developing countries particularly mandated issues which remain unresolved but are still extremely important. Uh, we believe the issues, uh, uh, these issues include negotiations on the Doha Development Agenda, uh, paragraph 44, on strengthening special and differential treatment provisions, and agriculture issues such as domestic support, special safeguard mechanisms, and public stockholding for food security purposes. These issues are crucial for addressing uh, food and livelihood security difficulties for developing uh, countries. Uh, we believe there should be reforms or new rules on digital trade. Uh, this would provide uh, developing countries with the requisite policy space for the development of the digital economy and other sectors. Uh, we believe also that there should be reform on transparency that take into account the capacity and resource difficulties of developing countries. Uh, the reform should support developing countries' ability to address their difficulties through a simplified notification format with a prolonged uh, time frame in some situations and flexibility for small and vulnerable economies and least development, developed countries commensurate with their levels of uh, development. Uh, we believe there should be reform of the TRIPS agreement to strengthen international cooperation on access to technology and innovation and uh, we believe that uh, there should be uh, the dispute settlement understanding reform that incorporates the developmental needs of developing countries and address the capacity and accessibility challenges faced uh, by developing countries. I believe that uh, if these reforms are put in place, that will go a long way to assisting uh, the least developed countries. Thank you. Thank you very much for that contribution. Well, I have a final question by way of wrapping up this session. And if I may ask our panelists to give us the shortest TV version soundbite answers, but just to really focus our minds. For everybody watching this conversation today and still saying, I'm trying to make sense of the world. I'm just trying to think, when will normality in whatever form it comes return post COVID? What will the world look like? as we've spoken about climate change and digitalization. Where does my business fit within the context of the WTO? 
please, a summation of what are key themes that people should put foremost to mind by way of just making sense of the world today and the world that's upon us as well. So John Denton. Build resilience. Build resilience into your, build, in your business model. Build resilience into the way in which you approach the world because we do not know what the world is exactly going to look like. What we do know, there will be a number of conflicting signs that emerge and conflicting themes that will emerge and they will not necessarily congeal into one handy description of the world. But if you build capability, if you're able to digitize and build digital business models, if you're able to look at capability that you need to have, that's how you build resilience and resilience will get you through. Carlos Carrera. Sí, mi respuesta tiene que ver sobre todo con la necesidad de un mundo en donde haya mayor equidad. Creo que esta crisis del COVID-19 ha mostrado las profundas asimetrías que existen en, en muchos aspectos, el económico, el social, eh, el acceso a la salud. Y si hay un post-COVID-19 tiene que ser basado en el principio de equidad, de una solidaridad efectiva y no meramente proclamada. Eh, de manera tal que creo que todos tenemos que trabajar en esa, en esta dirección. El mundo debería ser diferente al que encontramos al momento de COVID-19. Honorable Minister Adebayo, Nigeria. Well, uh, I believe that uh, I, I agree with uh, uh, the first speaker who talked about resilience. I believe that with resilience, uh, uh, we can build a better world. I believe that. Uh, uh, with reforming the WTO. Uh, reforming the WTO will go a long way, especially in assisting uh, the uh, least developed countries and the developing countries. So I believe we should all be resilient and uh, hope for a better future. Thank you. Honorable Minister Yao in uh, Korea. Uh, thank you for the question. I think in Korea, we believe that, um, you know, crisis can be turned into opportunity. Uh, and I think innovation is the key. I mentioned this creativity and innovation of any person in this digitalized world. So uh, if we, you know, uh, keep our, uh, you know, the focus on this innovation and this, this strong will to turn a crisis into opportunity, then I think we will come out of this, uh, you know, crisis stronger than before uh, this uh, pandemic. Thank you. Gentlemen, let me thank you very much for your time. Uh, just to repeat, we've had on our panel today Carlos Maria Correa, who is the executive director of the South Centre. We have also had uh, John Denton, who is the secretary general of the International Chamber of Commerce. We have had His Excellency Johan Ku, who's the Minister for Trade and Industry and Energy in Korea. We've had His Excellency Ni Adebayo, the Minister of Industry, Trade and Investment in Nigeria. We did have, for a brief moment, um, the Honorable uh, Anne-Marie Trevelyan, the uh, new Minister of Trade for Britain and the United Kingdom, but unfortunately we've had connectivity problems. So what we have done by way of uh, a mitigation so that she can contribute to this conversation, we have asked that they send us a recorded message that would uh, put forward um, Britain's view on WTO reforms and how to strengthen the multilateral system. And that recorded message will be added onto our online channels later on, where I suppose a recording of this conversation can also be viewed. And so you can see her uh, comments juxtaposed to the ones that have been shared here. But uh, we do thank the team for the minister trying to set her up, and it is um, just a pity that there was some connectivity and sound issues. But c'est la vie, that is the world of technology until technology becomes the bedrock of what we do and re-refine re those systems. Again, continue talking about these issues, what WTO reform means to you as an entrepreneur, as a woman, as somebody in the global south, even as somebody within a G20 member state, what this transformation could look like for the good of people planet and yes indeed profits ultimately keep that conversation going via social media twitter facebook and linkedin using the hashtag ask pf21 ultimately it's about innovation it's about creativity it's about being considerate about the next person and it is all about resilience that's the summation of our conversation this afternoon i'm lerato mbele thank you for your time
As we well know, Brexit is now a reality and Britain remains the fifth largest economy in the world. And so a tour de force, a significant voice in the sphere of international trade. In our conversation, WTO reforms and how to strengthen the multilateral system, we're joined by the Right Honourable Anne-Marie Trevelyan, who is the Secretary for State, Secretary of State for International Trade for the United Kingdom, just to share her views on what it would take to reform the World Trade Organization and also strengthen the multilateral system. Hello, I'm Anne-Marie Trevelyan. I'm the new International Trade Secretary of State here in the UK government, and I'm really pleased to be able to share a few thoughts uh, with the WTO Public Forum. Uh, one of the first things I did when I took over this role was to pick up the phone to uh, the WTO's wonderful Director General, uh, Dr Ngozi. In our wide-ranging conversation, she encouraged me to make my debut to share my thoughts at the public forum, and I'm really pleased to be able to do so. I think we are all united in our belief of the importance of fair and open markets. But for me, that's about also generating wealth, which pays for public services, creating better jobs, higher wages, and raising living standards across our wonderful planet in every country. And that's why I see fair and open markets as the best way forwards for us all, not just those of us who are already very strong, especially as we make sure that we are all able to build back better, stronger and resilient after the challenges that COVID has wrought across all our nations. The biggest impact that we have had globally on poverty reduction is by embracing free and fair trade, creating opportunities for international commerce, which benefit everyone. I feel that very deeply having seen in the past as Secretary of State for International Development how developing nations have grown on the strength of their enterprise and their ingenuity. That's why we are working through our G7 presidency to bring together the world's leading democracies in our shared vision to build back better and stronger through trade. The UK will also be rallying a global coalition as hosts of the COP26 Climate Change Summit, where we hope to pave the way for a sustainable recovery. But we cannot ignore the fact that the rules of the road in global trade are dated, and that the WTO rulebook is struggling to keep pace with both the global challenges of the present and indeed the industries of the future. Climate change, sustainability, digitalization, our response to the pandemic, we must be able to make progress on all of these issues at the WTO. Trust in the system has become eroded and there is a sense that we are not all operating on a level playing field. Our transparency obligations to each other are not always respected. But I believe that MC12 is a chance to start putting that right. I will be working to help members make progress in three areas. Firstly, promoting the better functioning of the WTO by getting the negotiating function working again. So I'm delighted about the very positive developments in the Joint Statement Initiative on the domestic regulation of services. I sincerely hope that we can now reach a successful agreement on this at MC12. Better functioning also means finalising the long-standing fisheries negotiations. We also need to get the dispute resolution system back on track. Secondly, modernising the rules that exist in areas where we want to do more, like health and the environment, and establishing rules in new areas like e-commerce and women's economic empowerment. And thirdly, of course, promoting free and fair trade, which means tackling market distorting practices and making sure that members take on obligations commensurate with their size and level of development. And that is, I absolutely admit, quite an agenda, but I'm also realistic that what we can achieve at MC12 is really impressive. But that's the direction we therefore must head in and through MC12 and of course beyond. The approaching ministerial conference is an ideal moment for us to reflect on the need to address those challenges in ways that are inclusive, flexible and transparent and which deliver the results that I know all of us as members wants to see. And I'm really looking forward to working together to achieve that. Thank you.